another classic radio air check on the home of classic top 40 radio airchecks.com and now the time by my h samuel everright watch is 9 30 precisely And good evening, everyone. Woodbine quiz time comes to you tonight from the Ealing Town Hall. So now just sit back in your chairs and relax because. The stargazers are up there. Canesham, spelled K E Y N S H A M, Canesham, Bristol. <laughs> Radio Luxembourg's rise to stardom is a story with all the ingredients of a bestseller. Intrigue, entertainment, and more than a dash of glamour. When it started in the 1930s, and later in the 40s and 50s, it became such an important part of the broadcasting fabric that millions preferred its laid-back style to the more formal tones of John Reith's BBC. In fact, it was following the pattern of the growing number of English-language commercial radio stations on the continent. Luxembourg was a late starter, but it had the most powerful transmitter of them all. Owned by a French company, it promised international broadcasts which would not favour any one nation. The English service was handled by an agency, Radio Publicity of London. They appointed 23-year-old Stephen Williams, who had been directing English programmes at Radio Paris, to be principal announcer. He remembers arriving in December 1933 with several hundred records and a couple of hampers of musical arrangements. We had a meeting with everybody likely to be interested and it was decided that the various nations round and about should be given days of influence. For instance, the Germans were Thursdays, the French were Saturdays and the English were Sundays. We managed to call it the Sunday because we knew that our rivals at the BBC were doing the dullest of their programs of the whole week on Sundays. They liked good, very good music, very nice music, very interesting music, but not of general popular appeal. And that was how we started. The country, no larger than Greater London, had been allocated a low-power, medium-wave frequency for internal needs. The radio station refused to accept it and chose long wave instead, because to make money from foreign language commercials, the signal needed to cover great distances. The British government called the broadcasts objectionable and through the Foreign Office condemned the violation of international agreements on radio. The BBC embarked on a lengthy battle to scupper the station, which it described as a scandal, insolent and a pirate. Officially the BBC was opposed to Radio Luxembourg, it was opposed to all commercial broadcasting. First of all I think they thought it was very vulgar, it wasn't the sort of thing that gentlemen should be engaged in and after all Sir John Reith did say that he'd like to gather around him a company of gentlemen to run this new idea of wireless broadcasting. The Newspaper Proprietors Association were as opposed to Radio Luxembourg as the BBC. They were appalled to discover that most of the sponsors were also advertisers in the big national dailies. Worried about the potential loss of revenue, they refused to publish programme details in their papers, a situation that lasted until the 1950s. However, they were carried in the radio pictorial magazine, whose editor wrote, The BBC give their best, but that need not deafen us to the fact that there are additional programmes of an alternative character. Well, it's just two minutes after half past eleven, and yes, you guessed it first time, that means Sunday night request time at Luxembourg. Let's meet at the organ. A program in which Sidney Torch and his friends entertain you at the organ. Cadbury's of Bourneville send you this musical variety to announce their new Rosie's Chocolates assortment. The makers of Bile Beans present Rhyme with Reason, featuring the three Heron sisters, the two Black Notes, 
and Marius B. Winter's Seven Swingers. Ladies and gentlemen, rhyme with reason. By the end of 1934, sponsored programmes in English were on the air daily, from noon to midnight on Sundays and for shorter periods during the week. But no one really knew the size of the audience, as Stephen Williams admits. We had a London office who got a certain number of letters in, and quite a number of letters came straight through to Luxembourg, usually with the wrong postage on, because people didn't realise that Luxembourg talking English and sounding so English was a foreign station, and therefore required, in those days, a two-penny halfpenny stamp. Most of our letters arrived with a one-penny halfpenny stamp on them, so we had quite a lot of excess postage to pay, but we had no idea at all, as far as audience reactions concerned, of how many people were listening. Of course, the advertisers kept tabs on it because they knew how their sales were going. Stay as sweet as you are, don't let a soul rearrange you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is John Wood speaking. And the serenading voice you have just heard was Jack O'Day, the Oxidol minstrel, sent to you by the makers of Oxidol, the marvelous new washing discovery that guarantees better washing and gives 23% more suds for your money. And now let's listen to Jack O'Day and the Oxidol Orchestra under the direction of Herbert Romain, playing and singing, I've got an invitation to a dance, March winds and April showers, and then be careful, young lady. From the beginning, the sponsors were allowed to create their own programs, although there were strict rules on the length of the sales messages. The football pools promoters and soap companies were the financial driving force. They were joined by patent medicines and remedies, department stores, even an encyclopedia of dogs, and of course the beverages. Of these, the fondest memories are reserved for the drink with its own badge, secret code and rule book. Good afternoon, everybody. Initial letter N speaking, chairman of the Grand Council of the League of Oval Teenies. I want you to listen to the Grand Council giving the roll call, just to make sure everybody's here. Are you ready? Go. O B A L T I N E Y S. Oval Teenies! <laughs> Oval Teen obviously stands out a mile, but they weren't the first. The very first of the of the big name commercial broadcasters was Palm Olive. The Palm Olive program with Olive Groves as Olive Palmer and Paul England as Paul Oliver, and Carol Gibbons and his orchestra as the Palm Olivers. They had a very successful half hour program every Sunday from eight to eight thirty. Oval Teen, I think, was the next big one to come. Horlicks, of course, had an hours program every Sunday, the Horlicks Tea Time Hour. The Gilmore British Picture Corporation had an hours film fans program. Oh, there were dozens and dozens of them. We even had an astrologer called Professor Eltana, who would read your horoscope in return for a three halfpenny stamp. Sometime later, I found that the voice behind that was a young up-and-coming broadcaster, or he hoped he was, a young actor called Roy Plumley. Roy Plumley became one of the first of many familiar voices who made their names on continental commercial radio. Another, who appeared regularly in the 1930s, was a young Canadian, Huey Green. Luxembourg was great in the hearts of the British public because before the war, it was the only station that gave you really anything as far as entertainment went because Lord Wraith, uh, God rest his soul, didn't feel that we should be telling jokes and singing funny songs on a Sunday. Uh, you had a couple of other stations. You had Post Parisian and you had Radio Normandy. But Luxembourg was it. This was the razzmatazz. This was the, the mass public's station. It punched it out. I mean, the, the power there was tremendous. That's why the Germans took it over and turned it around and used it against the Russians. As Europe lumbered helplessly towards the Second World War, Stephen Williams remembers being in the studio when news was broadcast of the murder of the Austrian Chancellor. Just in time, he noticed the title of the next piece of music, Viennese Caprice. As tension heightened, even the children's messages from the chief Ovaltini came under scrutiny. One of the chiefs of the Luxembourg secret police came to my office and demanded to know what I was doing by vitiating the terms of the license under which we broadcast, which prohibited the use of code messages. And I said, but we haven't broadcast any code messages. He said, you have 17.30 on Sunday evening. And then, of course, the penny dropped, and I realized it was that damn oval teeny message. Now for my message in our own secret code. 
first word, 46, 10, 2, 36. <laughs> when I translated it to him, all it said was, Ovaltine at bedtime helps you sleep. And he was quite disappointed. He went away convinced that when he'd, when he'd come, he was convinced that he was on the track of aspiring or something. And the last word, four, two, fourteen, ten. Goodbye, my little oval teeny friends. Goodbye. Duchy of Luxembourg was reported this morning by Mr. John Cudahy, the United States Minister to Belgium, in a message from Brussels to Washington. The war changed the sound of European radio. The continental commercial stations gradually went off the air as the German invasion spread. At home, the BBC softened its attitude and employed several of the presenters who'd found themselves out of a job, including Stephen Williams. Luxembourg, however, continued to broadcast but the sound changed from entertainment to Nazi propaganda. Germany calling, Germany calling, Germany calling. Here are the Reichs and the Hamburg. The mocking voice of William Joyce, who became better known as Lord Haw Haw because of his wild and fabricated news stories. The British Ministry of Misinformation has been conducting a systematic campaign of frightening British women and girls about the danger of being injured by splinters from German bombs. While the Nazi broadcasts continued, the British government was hatching its own plans for Luxembourg. It was determined that uncontrolled commercial broadcasts to Britain should not be allowed to resume. But it also had a secret scheme to use the transmitter for the BBC's Eastern Europe services once the war was over. By September 1944, events began to move quickly. This is the BBC Home Service. Here is the news read by Stuart Hibbert. Correspondents with the American First Army report this evening that Allied troops have entered the city of Luxembourg, capital of the Grand Duchy. For the second time in 30 years, the people of Luxembourg have been liberated from the invading Germans. We now salute the smallest of our allies. <laughs> American troops from Psychological Warfare Division took over the radio station with Britain's backing. The broadcasts were designed to build up the morale of all the Allied prisoners of war. When peace came, the Americans turned Luxembourg into an entertainment station for their forces in Europe. The Americans were impressed and opened negotiations with the Luxembourg administration for the continued use of the station as the voice of America in Europe. But the talks broke down over money. This was Britain's chance. Stephen Williams was asked to return to Luxembourg and reopen the English service, but not to disclose he was working in close liaison with the government and the BBC. Cabinet papers from the period show that in October 1945, the government was trying to purchase a two-year lease. Cabinet distribution from the Foreign Office to Brussels, copies to Paris and Washington, October 1945. It is for consideration whether His Majesty's Government should take steps as a matter of urgency to obtain control of Radio Luxembourg as a vehicle for the BBC services to Germany and Austria and in order to prevent the station being used for commercial broadcasting to this country. The authorities in Luxembourg, who were prepared to cooperate in an American takeover, told the British that they must negotiate with the station's French owners. The talks lasted a year, but fell through when it emerged that the French government was also trying to conduct a private deal. On the 12th of September 1946, Radio Luxembourg announced that English-sponsored programmes would begin again at the end of the year. Can you imagine going out to Luxembourg, just two or three of us, having no audience, really, to speak of, having to get them all back, to find them all, because, after all, they'd lost the habit. Geoffrey Everett, who worked for Luxembourg for almost 25 years, starting as an amateur football commentator and ending up as general manager. There were many things in those early days after the war that were very confused. For instance, when we first started earning money from sponsorship, 
the British government, the Treasury, would not allow us to take that money back to Luxembourg. I remember that Mr. Felton, who was then chief engineer, and now is, I think, president, wanted to get Marconi to build a transmitter here and take it to Luxembourg and build. They wouldn't even let us spend the money in England. And it went on for years, and there was a natural thing. You know, it's foreign. But the audiences returned, lured initially by request shows, and in 1948, the first chart countdown on British radio. The top 20 made the names of its first presenters, Teddy Johnson and Pete Murray, and listening at 11 o'clock on a Sunday night snowballed into a national institution. For many, many years, the top 20 program on, on Radio Luxembourg uh, was the only one. And of course, it wasn't based on the sales of records in those days. It was based on the sales of sheet music. And it had an enormous listening figure. If I tell you that it had something like 10% of the listening audience, at that time of night, between 11 and 12, that was unbelievable. Really was. <laughs> It was the only place that people could hear the hit records because, as you know, the other stations they, the, at home, the BBC stations, didn't really cater for popular music at all. You'd have a half-an-hour programme, maybe at midday and once a week, and then there was Jack Jackson on a Saturday night between 11 and 12, and that was it. As listening figures overtook the pre-war levels, sponsors again queued for airtime. There was still plenty of popular music in the schedules, but now the range also included a mix of comedy, drama and quiz shows. Radio Luxembourg's popularity helped other businesses. The expansion of the music press and the independent recording studios. One of the most prolific was Star Sound, which had taped, yes, tape recording had arrived, Luxembourg's first post-war show. Star Sound was now busily turning out programmes from adventure serials like Perry Mason, brought to you by the makers of Tide, to What's My Line? The panel game in which David Nixon, Isabel Barnes, Richard Attenborough and Barbara Kelly guessed contestants' occupations, courtesy of cornflakes. I think that was the best era of Luxembourg because we catered for everybody. And uh, we had some really marvellous shows on the air. I remember the David Whitfield shows with the Squadron Airs Orchestra, which were fabulous. The Tommy Trinder programmes were great. And the Ted Heath Orchestra, which we featured, we used to record a great deal of. We had Dan Dare, I can tell you. I remember that very well. It was a very popular serial. And uh, Princess for a Day. Of course, Opportunity Knocks. It's Huey Green! Opportunity Knocks! <laughs> yes, for the next half hour, the makers of Beecham's Pills and Pensick Tablets invite you to listen to the all-winners program of Opportunity Knocks with Jack Dobb and his quintet and the talents and voices you, the listeners, have discovered. And here now to introduce the all-winners is your master of opportunities, Huey Green! We went to Luxembourg in 1950, and we went there and stayed there, I think, for the best part of six to seven years, uh, in which times out of the show came The Bachelors, the late David Whitfield and a number of other people who went on to fame and fortune, Joe Henderson, that was Opportunity Knox. Luxembourg in those days was a station that had big programs on. We had W Money and we had Take Your Pick. It was a middle of the road mass entertainment program. The choice of these programs rested with a sponsor. All Luxembourg retained was the right of veto. The output was a true mishmash, but it did generate the birth of a number of original ideas, including Take Your Pick with Michael Miles and the mystery of box number 13, and Double Your Money, radio's biggest cash quiz game, with its £32 question. A change from the BBC's prize of a visit to the studios. Take Your Pick went on to capture an audience of over 7 million in 1955. That's more than we're listening to Hancock's Half Hour, Housewives' Choice or 20 Questions. But some of the programmes of the 50s, like Opportunity Knox and Much Binding in the Marsh, had actually run first on the BBC. Geoffrey Everett insists none of them was pinched. Some of them were programmes that the BBC had had uh, not continued with. Jack Jackson had an enormous revival on Luxembourg. He, he uh, don't let me for one moment indicate that it wasn't the BBC. It was the BBC that made Jackson. But um, in his 
oh, I don't know, the last five years on the Decker show on Luxembourg. He was absolutely tremendous. The figures were enormous. Oh, it's Saturday. Yes, it's Saturday. And hello, there, record fans, wherever you are. Once again, it's time for another roundup of all your favorite British and American recording artists. Brought to you by the Decker Record Company for your special delight tonight. Oh, excuse me, madam. Yes? I work for Luxembourg, you see. Oh, I am sorry. I'm afraid I can't help you. No, 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 no. I was hoping you'd play chaperone to this young fellow. Who, me? Jack Jackson. And Mr. Jackson is surely responsible for so many of us who like to mix a little comedy with our music. But according to Geoffrey Everett, it's not Jack Jackson's show or any other show that people remember most from the period. They invariably recall a curious advertisement which claimed it could help listeners to win the football pools. Only one thing, Horace Batchelor. Now, on one occasion, I always remember it, I went down to Bristol to see him and he said, Geoffrey, I want to do the commercials myself. Now, if you had met Horace and heard him, you'd have thought he was the last man in the world. Poor old chap, his heavy Bristol accent, and he used to take his false teeth out before he started. That didn't help. And I said, oh, Horace, are you sure this is the right thing? He said, no complaints with what you're doing, but I want to do them. It was an ego trip. He did it very badly, and I almost felt I ought not to let it be broadcast. You won't believe it, but he doubled the replies. Good evening, friends. The name is Horace Batchelor. A household word where football pools are concerned. Last Saturday again, we had quite a number of surprise draws, which were also a great surprise to you. But my intra-draw method still found most of those surprise drawn games. All I did was that little bit at the end, uh, Horace Batchelor intra-draw method, Canesham, K-E-Y-N-S-H-A-M, Canesham at Bristol. Countless listeners continue to assume that Radio Luxembourg was situated in Britain. Huey Green, who'd been a pilot during the war, decided to find out more about the station to which he was supplying programmes. I had in the back of my mind something upstairs over a shop in which one end of the room there were a bunch of French, but at the other end of the room with a lot of bits and wires and corny bit old microphones were a couple of Englishmen. So I landed my aeroplane at the airfield there, went into town, checked into the hotel and asked for Luxembourg. And I walked past it twice. It was in the most enormous grounds with beautiful trees and a, a driveway that went up to it. So I went up this driveway, climbed up these steps, these magnificent doors, rapped on the doors, and the voice says, just a moment, I'm coming. And down he comes, this man, opens the door, and that was when I met Pete Murray. Uh, and I can remember on Saturday nights that I would do a two-and-a-half-hour stint, and, uh, which would include just hitting the gong and saying, this is Radio Luxembourg, introducing uh, a sponsored program, but there would be live programs I had to present myself. And I can remember I was doing a program called The Irish Hour, which was followed immediately by Log Cabin Lullaby. Well, I thought it was a bit ridiculous saying hello and goodbye and hello again. So what I did was say goodbye to the Irish saying this is your old darling boy Pete Murray saying good boy now cheers good luck to you and uh, I developed this character Pedro and I and used to used to go <coughs> pong, hit the dong hi friends this is Radio Ruxin yes sir it's your old pal Pedro the old old Kevin lullaby here we go sir and go into a bit of hoedown or whatever and what was extraordinary was that in West Germany for example there was a very big American audience uh, GIs and Air Force personnel and uh, the most popular character on Luxembourg then was Pedro it's wonderful to hear somebody from back home they used to say <laughs> according to Geoffrey Everett after the breakdown of the government's plan to take over Luxembourg the BBC resumed its pressure on performers to steer clear of the commercial station I was the person responsible for breaking it by insisting that Alma Cogan should do a programme on Luxembourg when she was starring in Take It From Here, the BBC programme. And she said, oh, they won't let me do it. But I want to do it, she said. I remember Sidney Grace, her agent, ringing me up and saying, you know, the BBC will throw her out. She'll never be allowed to do it. But she did it. And the BBC didn't throw her out. And from that day, artists started appearing on both the BBC 
and Luxembourg. Your request records will always play. If you drop a note to us and do it right away, give the tune on the label and your favorite star. To him to do away, my friends, and there you are. In 1951, that's just what listeners had to do, for the parent company decided it could make more money by using the long-wave transmitter for the expanding French service. English programmes were switched to 208 metres, medium wave, and broadcasts were confined to evenings only. Despite background whistles and a fading signal, 208 became the best-known radio frequency until the birth of Radio 1, 16 years later. This is Radio Luxembourg on 208 metres, medium wave. Good evening from yours truly, Jeffrey Everett. In fact, it's a very... Good evening, everybody. This is your friendly station, Radio Luxembourg, calling you on 208 meters medium wave and 49.26 meters short wave. Your announcer, this first half of the evening, is Keith Fordyce, and a special warm good evening. Just past 8 o'clock at your station of the stars, Radio Luxembourg. There have always been problems over the quality of Luxembourg's sound because of the distance it has to travel. In 1937, the BBC's Deputy Director General had described the difference between the two stations as between an early gramophone and the latest HMV 100 Guinea Wonder. For all that's worthwhile, your radio dial is on Radio Luxembourg. The radio station issued a triumphal press release in 1957, proclaiming that the competition from television was not affecting the audiences, which was true. However, commercial TV was sapping 208's advertisers and even some of its programmes. Geoffrey Everett. In the period, I would think, from about 1949 to 1960, there was a tremendous amount of sponsorship. And then things got difficult. We were in pretty dire straits financially, and not the parent company. The parent company was always, and has been, and is very financially sound. The only way I could see that we would make money and encourage Luxembourg parent company to keep us on the air was to accept sponsored programs from record companies. I thought it was wrong, but we were in a pretty bad way. Capital was the first one. And then afterwards, of course, um, well, Deco and EMI, well, everyone. Well, what do you know? It's the Capital Show! The big top's a blaze of light, and this is Ray Orchard inviting toppers everywhere to gather round as, for the next 30 minutes, we call into the center ring, please, Capital Stars. Dean Martin, Tommy Sands, Ray Anthony, and Andy Griffith. Baron Young, Jackie Davis, Dean Reed, and the Andrews sisters. Frank Sinatra, Richard Cannon, Gene Vincent, and the Rinky Dink. label, yet again from the Everly Brothers, that'll be the day. And for sure, pop pickers, that's the record night tonight, so remember, it's tomorrow night at nine. All right? Right. And that means, good night. The record companies took over from the soap powder companies, and I really think that's when the deterioration of, of Luxembourg actually started. Because prior to that, if I presented a program, or Peter Madden, or Geoffrey Everett, we had our own personalities and the records to go with them. We played what we liked, and so every program was different. And I think it was the first format program. I think it lost an awful lot that way. Perhaps lost is rather harsh, but Luxembourg certainly had to find a new market. The record companies were ideal because this was the swinging 60s when adolescents were recast into teenagers, a brand new consumer group with money to spend. They were egged on by a whole new breed of advertisers. Wake up in the morning, there's a snap around the place. Wake up in the morning, there's a crackle in your face. 
wake up in the morning, there's a pop that really says right simply to you and you and you. We're on the milk and listen to the sand that says it's nice. We're on the milk and listen to the crackle of that rice. Get up in the morning to the pop that says it's rice. Hear them talking crisp rice krispies. Luxembourg set its sights on youth and non-stop music and in doing so heralded a period now firmly part of folklore where millions of teenagers listened secretly on transistors under the bedclothes at night. One of the staff DJs at the time was Chris Denning. Many of the programmes were sponsored by record companies and of course as anyone of that age group will remember only about the first minute and a half of the record was played which was very annoying to the listener but the record company research said that they still would buy the record even if they only heard a snippet and were annoyed. So they didn't mind them being annoyed as long as they bought the records. And of course they had no alternative because Radio Luxembourg apart from I think two programmes a week on BBC there was David Jacobs and Alan Freeman there was no other place where you could hear pop music on the BBC or in Britain. So therefore Luxembourg had it made but once the pirates were there and they were playing records in full the writing was on the wall it had to change when the pirates started i was very worried it was the first time i think that i woke up to the fact that we weren't catering very well for young people and uh, i'm going to be honest with you i think we copied their format a little bit perhaps by doing it we lost a lot of the old faithful listener it became a different type of audience Green is go. Go with two oh eight. Suddenly, the pirates were the rebels, and Luxembourg emerged, as the BBC had earlier, as the tired radio station that sounded out of date. The programme ideas were no longer fresh, as Chris Denning recalls. When I joined Radio Luxembourg, the Beatles had been around about a year, and they really were at the peak of their prestige and uh, popularity. And it was obvious that Luxembourg needed a Beatles show, so I suggested to Geoffrey Everett and Barry Aldis that we should have one, and probably simply because I was the one who suggested that I got to do it. And as I recall, it was on a couple of times a week, and I would sit down with them in a hotel room or backstage and record chat with them which i would then edit together and i'd get them to say things like what shall we now play or what are we going to do next and so when it came over it actually sounded as though we were all sitting perhaps in a dressing room but every now and then they'd pick up their instruments and play their latest number which amazingly they played with absolute studio quality because it was the record really can we have a request chris uh, uh, yeah, Paul, yeah please okay this one is for bernard levin wolf mankovitz and good old don zek and the song, it, I'd like you to sort of play for them, because I think it has a sort of special meaning. Do you want to know a secret? How about you having one, John, then? OK, how about John having him on? I'd like to play one for Mr H. Wilson of Hampstead Garden Suburb. And it's called Thank You, Girl. Yes, Ringo. I'd like you to play one for Don Short of the Daily Mirror and Judith Simons of the um, Express, and it's called I'll Follow the Sun. In 1968, Radio Luxembourg discarded its famous sponsored shows and followed the BBC's lead on the new Radio 1 by introducing all live programming along with spot ads, the format that still exists today. <laughs> to present this, they needed a new team of disc jockeys. Swinging 208 has a special significance for me because I was invited to join that lineup. My time with Radio Luxembourg, admittedly not the longest stay on record, was for me an exciting period. And in a little less than a year, this unique radio station gave me an invaluable apprenticeship. 208 in the late 60s was the only place for aspiring DJs. Kid Jensen came all the way from Canada to join the team. And the weather word for Britain, rain at times with sunny spells, maximum high 13 degrees centigrade. That's international news from the 208 News Desk in conjunction with the Daily Mirror News Desk, Friday evening, April 23rd. It's three and a half past eight o'clock, the next scheduled news at nine. When 208 News ends, music instantaneously begins on the Tony Prince Show. <laughs> serving solid sounding super duper smile station the station that spots a successful sound soonest and this is your royal ruler i wouldn't fool you nothing could be cooler this is tony prince hi kids hiya oh 
Did we really talk that fast? So what would they make of that sound back in those early days? Pioneer Stephen Williams was never impressed. They talked such absolute rubbish. It was completely inconsequential. It was just chatter. And as I said to a number of them, if I'd still been the boss there, I wouldn't have let them in under any circumstances, whatever. Because it wasn't the sort of entertainment. I mean, I couldn't foresee. I certainly never dreamed that they'd become as popular as they are. And what really shook me was I met somebody who was connected with Luxembourg and I said, what on earth are you doing with all these chaps talking absolute nonsense and rubbish? He said, well, this is the disc jockey idea. After all, you launched the very first disc jockey on Radio Luxembourg, Christopher Stone. And I said, good God, Christopher Stone, he'd die if you called him a disc jockey. <laughs> For another view, I turn to Jimmy Savile. First of all, it's got considerably more opposition. You've got some great independent stations in Britain, and Radio 1, of course, is a giant. Of that, there's no doubt. That doesn't mean to say that Luxembourg, because it comes from far away, should be any less great than it was. It's just going through the doldrums at the moment. I would say that it's a bit on the dead side at the moment, but that's because, possibly, the people concerned with it are not the pirates that they used to be. We all felt we were pirates in the old days. We were piratical. And now they're all business people and nice people. God bless them, uh, lovely, but it hasn't got the flavour it had because it hasn't got the pirates it had. And I was the worst, I was Blackbeard. True, Luxembourg may no longer be Britain's only independent commercial music station, but no one can take away the contribution it's made to popular music. Its warmth and spontaneous style has influenced radio presentation to this day. It's still going trying to stay ahead of the field with different formats from disco music and the top singles to live interviews in London. Yes, London. After 50 years, Radio Luxembourg has been given a permanent landline to the Grand Duchy. As for its audience, after dipping to one million, it's now at one and a half. But how long will Luxembourg go on? Will it still be here in another 50 years? Managing Director Maurice Bass is optimistic. We'll carry on slightly improving our audience. I'm pretty sure of that. The formula seems to work. There's nothing very clever about what we do. People want disc jockeys who are entertaining to talk to them between records. We do this. We like to think we do it reasonably well. I think another major reason why we're still here and plan to be here for the next 50 years is that Radio Luxembourg is part of a giant commercial broadcasting unit that operates throughout Europe. I know from the plans that they're talking about launching satellites and cable systems and they're operating in television and radio throughout the whole of Europe. I know they're going to stay ahead of the game. first anti-establishment radio station. It had a glamour, it had a certain naughtiness and began to listen to it. I think that Luxembourg's success is amazing in view of the fact that they have never been able to have an audience just switch on and get perfect reception. And I tell you this, I think Luxembourg will go on forever because I think it's become something that people say, oh, Radio Luxembourg, yes. Oh, I remember this, I remember that. Everyone's got a memory. And that's as good a place as any to end, for the time being, the longest-running story in commercial radio. As they used to say at closed down, it's time to say goodnight. And, of course, time to wish you all a very happy Christmas.